so we, I just walked you through a very quick and dirty uh, revenue buildup for two types of businesses. Once we built that, now we really focus on cost of goods sold, or our, once we built that, we focus on expenses. We usually start off with cost of goods sold, and the way we think about cost of goods sold is, for every incremental user or customer, what are the expenses associated with that? So it's a per unit thing. You want to be thinking in per unit expenses. Um, if you're making a, a, you know, a water bottle, every per sale is the plastic cost of the plastic and the cost of the water, right? That's a, that's a per unit type of assumption. Um, for something like an online video site, every uh, user would drive X amount of tra traffic, uh, and you have to pay for that bandwidth. So that's the per unit metric there. Step number two is build your hiring plan. Um, we talked about that a little bit. You know, who do you need to support this business as you grow? Engineers, marketing, you start to layer on management at some point, kind of a layer of management. Um, and then build the marketing and sales budgets, pretty straightforward. Um, you know, I, I encourage startups to, to really, I think you, this is part of your class at some point, but really spending the time to develop a good marketing plan and, and how that would change over time. And then any other OPEX and CAPEX. So you, you have to be inclusive here so you don't miss expenses. It's better to be, to, to include more expenses than you think than to miss expenses, because if you didn't include expenses, Later on, you get tripped up when you run out of money. Yes, sir. Can you please tell us what is op more about OPEX op op and uh, CAPEX and the differences between them? Sure. So, like I mentioned, cost of goods sold is usually a per unit thing. What happens every time a new customer or a new product is sold? OPEX and CAPEX are more fixed costs or costs that aren't driven by a per unit thing. So, for example, your monthly rent. You've got you know, $2,000 rent, whether you sell one unit or a thousand units, you can't change that. That's an example of an operating expense. Or, um, you know, maybe you're paying an attorney 2,000 bucks a month. That's a little bit easier to adjust, but it's still, it's a kind of a fixed stream of costs. CapEx typically refers to uh, physical goods like machinery, or even for an internet startup, you would treat your, um, computers and monitors and all that stuff, or even furniture, as CapEx. Um, and so, not to get too caught up in accounting, but CapEx, you would plug it into the model when you spend you know, 10, 10 grand on a bunch of laptops, and then you would depreciate it, but we don't want to get too down into it. Yes. So we haven't thought about you know, the money that you have to pay to the venture capitalists and other people, which basically will take away 90% of, <laughs> of your revenue in the beginning. <laughs> <Sorry>. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I, I, um, you wouldn't necessarily model that so much because if you're raising venture capital, they'll typically get paid back when you exit, like when you hire Kelly Porter and you sell your company, they'll get paid back then. Um, if you're doing a debt deal, like you're taking a loan from Silicon Valley Bank, and you have to pay, you know, make repayments every month, you would definitely model that in. So the money you pay back to VC is not so much a loan or other debt, definitely, yeah. Any other questions on this topic? Um, okay, so we've done a revenue buildup, we've done an expense buildup. Um, you know, I like this quote. These guys are, are VCs with a, a firm called Foundry Group in Boulder. They've done a lot of really interesting deals. Smart, smart guys, great blog. I think they have a book out too called Venture Deals. Um, but I like this quote. You know, you can't predict your revenue with any kind of precision, but you should be able to predict your cost structure pretty well, especially over the next one to two years. And, and going in to an investor and saying, we, um, you know, we expect to spend a million dollars and here's how we're gonna spend it and here's where it will get us is a really strong, strong foothold to go into an investor versus we have a vision, we need money to do it. And in many cases, we'll even start by building a, a budget or expense worksheet before doing the whole model. Not to throw you a curveball there, but um, understanding your expenses is important because again, running out of money is the number one cause of startups going bust. 
Um, so we built our, our revenue build up, our forecast. We've built the accompanying costs. Um, now what do we do? We take this all and turn it into proper uh, P&L, proper income statement. Um, I'll show you an example in just a minute. But basically, we start by summarizing the monthly income and expenses and roll that up into quarterly. And then we roll that up into annual summary so we can show this nice P&L of where this business is going to go over the next couple of years. Um, we make some adjustments to get to cash flow. And again, I don't want to bore you with the accounting details. But for example, there's a difference between uh, <coughs> depreciation. And, and there's some ways we treat different things, like computer equipment. We capitalize it and depreciate over time. But you really want to focus on cash flow, what actually comes in and out of the business. Um, and then we tie it all together and look at this, this, this model and say, does this look right? Does this feel right? Do the growth rates, the margins, the headcount uh, seem reasonable? Again, you're applying kind of a sanity check. And then finally, to the extent we can, we want to break these things into per user economics. This is really great when you're going to talk to investors too. If you can talk about your, your big picture vision, where this goes over five years, how much you need to get there, but then you can also talk about a per user economic basis. Every, uh, you know, Zynga's great at this, right? Every, um, Every member is spending X amount on virtual goods, and it's costing us Y to, to service that, that person. Um, are you guys familiar with kind of per unit economics? Should I cover this a little bit? Medium? You got it pretty good? Oh, cover it. OK, sorry. Um, again, just almost think of like in, uh, in a very uh, explicit way, what does one customer or one unit of product, if you're selling a product, uh, generate in revenue? And what does it generate in costs? Um, you know, um, and we think about it in terms of like revenue per sale, cost of goods per sale, marketing costs of sale, um, and shipping costs per sale. Like if you're Zappos, you have a pretty clear visibility into what it costs uh, when you sell a $60 pair of shoes. And you probably also know, you know, they're breaking it down to what it costs to, on average, to support that one person in terms of support costs, in terms of shipping. Um, and then also you want to think about what it costs to acquire that, that one customer, right? So you've spent $2 to drive someone to your website. Uh, shipping is $4. Um, the average customer support cost is another 2 or $3. Um, you know, you can add that up and come up with what your, your cost per customer is, and then you know your revenue. So this, we call it VC Valhalla equation. You've, you've entered the perfect zone for raising funding if you can show an investor that your lifetime value of a customer, less the cost to support that customer, um, is greater than your cost to acquire your customer. And in, in simpler terms, that means um, it costs you a a buck to acquire the customer it costs you 50 cents to support that customer. Your lifetime value of that customer is $3. Essentially, you're saying every dollar in generates $2 out the door, right? It's a great position to go in to go talk to investors. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a, a tough concept to get, but basically it shows you every customer is profitable on a per unit basis. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering how long the lifetime value of a customer would be. Do you take inflation into account and other different uh, time values of money? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's tricky because you can you know, massage the numbers a little bit, right? Uh, and you don't want to get overly aggressive. Part of the equation of how, how long, you know, what is the timeline on a lifetime value of a customer is a function of your churn rate. Um, if you're getting customers in the door and they're sticking around for a long time, um, if you're losing, um, you know, if you're losing 50% of your customers every six months, you have a pretty short time frame. If you're you're keeping them around for a couple of years, your lifetime value would have obviously be greater. When you're in the early days of startup, that doesn't help, right? Because you've maybe got three months of data, so you don't know how long people are sticking around. But you would probably then look at other comps, right? If you're in the retail business, how long can Zappos keep, keep them around? Stuff like that. Um, 
But yeah, the, the short answer to your question is the time duration is a, a inversely correlated with your churn rate. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, sir. I might have missed it. Can you go over what the equation means, the acronym or whatever? Uh, the lifetime value of the customer less the cost to uh, support the customer. When it's greater than your cost to acquire the customer, you're on fire. And this is why startups will raise these massive rounds, because they've shown that a dollar in, you know, in terms of investment, can produce $2 in, in value, basically. There's some great blogs on this, because it's a somewhat of a technical concept. Um, in this tool I'm going to show you, Founder Suite, we have a calculator that you can play around with and get familiar with um, lifetime value customer. And then there's also some good blog posts from Andrew Chen uh, on this topic, too. So for further reading.